Most people do not see God at work in their personal lives and therefore do not know how to join Him. This Divine Appointments podcast is to encourage you in your faith to open your eyes to seeing God's hand at work. My hope and prayer is that by hearing these stories, you too will engage where God is already working and discover God's mission for your life. Welcome to my Divine Appointments podcast. I have my friend, longtime new (laughs) reacquaintance, Ryan Wade. He is the community outreach pastor at Crossgates Baptist Church in Brandon. (laughs) I wanted to make sure that was right. (laughs) And uh, he and his wife have been friends for a long time as I've delivered some children for them. That's right. Um, I first want to share um, my theme scripture, which is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His accomplishments among the nations, sing to Him, make music to Him, tell about His miraculous deeds, boast about His holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and the strength He gives, seek His presence continually, Remember the miraculous deeds he performed, his mighty acts, and the judgments he decreed. So I have had the opportunity to work with uh, Ryan just recently on this Go Tell Metro Mississippi crusade, which we've been talking about a little bit lately, and that is by Rick Gage. Um, He's an evangelist nationally, and he brings crusades locally, but it's really a a grassroots effort. Sure. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so Rick Gage, his father was an evangelist for 50 years, and then uh, he was a football coach. And uh, even though his father was an evangelist, he was lost, but he came to faith uh, at an evangelistic meeting one night, and God just completely changed his life and sent him into evangelism. So he started in the 80s uh, as a youth evangelist, and then God laid on his heart to have his own ministry. So what he does is he goes more into the rural areas. So somebody like Billy Graham would have went to Los Angeles or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or New York, or Houston, and so the calling Rick has on his life is to go to more of a smaller or rural area, so 2019, they went to Scott County Forest, Mississippi, and had a crusade there. Forest. Yeah, mm-hmm. forest mm-hmm. on the football field, and yes. they had, uh, it's a, it usually does a four-night campaign, and so they had over 600 people make first-time decisions for Jesus in 2019, and so since that time, I remember being in a meeting uh, in early 2020 for that, And we were trying to bring the same type of of crusade effort into Rankin County in the metro area. But then COVID happened to put all that on pause. And so I guess for about a year, I've been trying to help uh, help this effort get off the ground and all of this coming to fruition. And so we're very excited about what's going to happen. It's going to be at the Brandon Amphitheater October 15th through the 18th. And it's just a great opportunity for believers to come and bring their lost friends, their neighbors, uh, co-workers. Um, for students to bring their classmates and so there's a lot that really goes into this and we're trying to get a lot of churches on board and so we're really expecting God to do some amazing things not only during the crusade but lasting far beyond the crusade. And I was at one of the preliminary meetings and sat next to the lady who was just a lay person in Forest, Mississippi. Yeah, Lynn Irby. Who, Lynn Irby and she brought uh, and got Rick to come but she got the help of all a lot of other people in the, that area in Scott County and I said what was it like she said it was incredible mm-hmm. just truly 600 people face down on this wet football field and yeah. come into Christ and she said it changed their community in a mm-hmm. huge way so I'm we're really excited about what can happen in the metro area the goal is to get 300 churches involved and t- talk about why that's yeah, and important. there's a reason that we uh, we have 300 churches as a goal to be involved. So there's two reasons. So the Brandon Amphitheater, which is where this is going to be, it's for the whole metro area. But as we went and looked at different venues, we saw that the Brandon Amphitheater, uh, it can hold 8,000 people a night. And a lot of people have been there and it's familiar to them. And so when you think about inviting someone who's not in our churches on Sunday morning, so 80% of our metro area is unchurched. 80%. So that's 80%. Huge. Just think about that. And And we're in the Bible Belt. Exactly. (laughs) No, exactly. So 80%, and we have a church on every corner. Right. And so people are no longer coming into the church to find answers. Right. They're trying everything else before they try the church. 
And so what we said and what Rick does with this campaign so graciously, he's really just a catalyst for the believers in this area to come together for the sake of reaching people far from God. Yeah. And so one of the reasons we want these churches on board is so um, 8,000 seats a night, clear gospel message. As we come together, and if we have 300 churches where the believers in those churches are inviting their lost neighbors, we are talking about some of our lost neighbors yeah. earlier, people that God's put on our heart, and we know they are far from God. And so maybe we've talked with them, we've had dialogue with them before, but we really don't know what the next step is. And they're really often intimidated by going to a big church. That's exactly right. What do I wear? What do I wear? <laughs> what are people going to think about me? Right. Are they going to ask me to stand up? Yeah. What's it going to be like? We all, right. Anytime you go somewhere new, there's, a, there's this hesitation you have. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have been to the Brandon Amphitheater to a concert, or, or you've been to a concert venue out under the stars. And so you can picture what that looks like. Right. But here you have someone saying, hey, let me tell you about something that changed my life, this message, but I want you to come in here. And so the Bible talks about God gifting certain people as evangelists. And so Rick Gage is one of those people. Mm. And so he's got a team. There are other speakers coming with him. But these are people that God is uniquely gifted to share the gospel in a clear way that penetrates and God uses them mm -hmm. for whatever reason. They're not any better, they're not any smarter. God's just decided to use people like this for harvest people. Right. But it takes people like you and me to invite people. The people we've been pouring into for a long time and answering their questions and being a witness to them and praying for them when things are down. And, and finally God uses people like these harvesters sometimes in a meeting like this to draw them for them to make that final decision to surrender their life to Christ. So we need the churches on board because we want you to invite your lost friends, your lost neighbors. But what if God blesses our, our desire? Our desire is for over a thousand salvations, mm. a thousand people in the metro to come to faith in Christ. Well, guess what? They can't all fit in one church. Right. So we want to fill up the churches in the metro area. We want every person who makes a decision for Jesus to be contacted by a church near their home. Because people are more likely to go to something to nearby have a in their community. Whole network of people to so, take these people in. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of times people ask the question, well, what happens to the follow up? Because this evangelist is going to move on. That's mm -hmm. true. He's going to go on to the next place. But we've been we working. We are the follow up. Exactly. <laughs> we've been working for over a year, and I'm personally going to be involved in the follow up and counseling part. So we're guaranteeing that every person who makes a decision is going to be followed up. That's why we want the churches. Mm -hmm. Because we want you to be able to have your church. Uh, seats or pews filled up with people in your community who found faith in Christ. And guess what? When somebody comes to faith in Christ, they've got a whole circle usually of influence of people far from God. They've yeah. got people in their home, their friends. It's a ripple and effect. It's, it's a ripple effect. Absolutely. And so that's one reason we're trying to get as many churches as possible on board. And there's one more reason we need volunteers. That's right. Because we do one-on-one -on -one counseling in events like this. And so we need ushers, we need greeters. We, we're praying for this we need a prayer team. So all these things that we're doing, we need hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. And this is a great way for believers to get equipped and be able to do something that they may have never been a part of before. Right. So we need four to 500 counselors a night. If you sign up to be a counselor, you're gonna be trained by Rick Gage's ministry and you're gonna feel very comfortable in what it's like to help lead somebody to Jesus. Right. Well, that's a huge benefit to these local churches. If they Absolutely. send 10 or 20 people to come be counselors, they're gonna come back knowing more what it's like to lead someone to Jesus than actually being able to experience that at the crusade. And we're hoping that it sets a fire uh, off in many churches, so to speak, where people are just excited about reaching people for right. Jesus and they know how to do it because they've just done it. God's just used them in an amazing way and so there's so much more going on than four nights in October. And I, I was drawn to it initially talking to Percy Thornton uh, about the youth mm. um, because we've been praying so much about our own children, our own youth group, and then seeing so many kids who are friends in their schools just in dark places, anxiety, depression, right. suicidal thoughts have increased, mm. especially since COVID and even more with our younger and younger kids and um, I just have such a burden and then to hear them talk about there's a whole youth night. There's right? a whole youth emphasis. So every night any age can come but Wednesday night in, in these crusades that Rick does they always set aside as a, a youth emphasis and so what does that mean? It means that the um, there's going to be free pizza at six o'clock <laughs> so students like free pizza That's right. so they can come to that. It also means the message will be more geared uh, towards someone of their age. And there's other things going on, like a local businessman, Noel Daniels, has decided he wants to give a car away to some 
some young person that night. Wow. So we're thankful for that. But it's going to be an opportunity for these students to come together and hear a message that can change their life. And so my son is going to be in 11th grade. He goes to high school with 1,600 students. And he comes home every week telling me about the brokenness in those hallways and in those bathrooms and in those classrooms. And so there's a message of hope out there. And like I think we were talking the other day, uh, that movie that impacted you, young people are looking for the right thing in the wrong places. That's right. And so this is a time where students can come together and invite the people in their hallways. I was one of those students far from God, yeah, even though I went story. to church. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm from Carthage, Mississippi, uh -huh. which is about an hour up the road. And my wife, Summer, is from Carthage as well. And so uh, a small grew up town. In the church. Yeah. I grew up going to a small Southern Baptist church, and uh, my wife did not go up going regularly to church. And so, but we each have our own story, um, but God was the author of all that. And so, but I went to church, and I did like what a lot of kids do. Um, I went to Sunday school, went to VBS, went to church camp. And so I remember I was probably in sixth grade where uh, responded to an invitation at church camp, but when I came down, it was more like a group hug. There was no counseling. Mm. And so it's only in later years that I've been able to process that, but, but basically I, I felt the need to be right with God, and so I, I made a step out to come forward, but there never was any, no one what led me to surrender. Me. Well, nobody yeah. led me even to surrender my life to Jesus. It was just the, the goal was that I got out of my seat. Uh, and so it led to what I know now is a false conversion. Mm. And so there never was any follow-up, any counseling. It was just, hey, you know, I got baptized. And so as I began to get older, I began to live like the world. But then I still went to church every Sunday. Mm. And so living in the South, I think that's a lot more common Absolutely. Than, than people in other parts of the world mm -hmm. would realize. And we so, see it, yeah. And it was reinforced by, by other people that I knew. Well, I could look, you know, we sat on the back row. Because that's just what you did. Back row Baptist. Back row Baptist. <laughs> but no, I literally remember, uh, you know, we'd be out on Saturday night doing whatever. And, you know, I could look over there and see other people, they were doing the same thing I was. So th there never was anything I, I saw that really challenged the worldview that I had. And so mm -hmm. the worldview that I picked up was God just wanted me to get baptized and to do more good than I did bad in my life. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we might call that a, a, a cultural Christianity or a good old boy mentality. And so that was me. Mm. So if something would have happened and I'd have died in a car wreck as a teenager, there would have been a funeral and they would have said that I was in heaven because at church camp in sixth grade I had walked down an aisle. But the reality is my life never changed. Mm. So I would say that I was a Christian on paper, but I never had an encounter with Jesus that changed my life. And I never had a desire for the things of God. Like, I went to church because I felt it was an expectation in my family. It was an expectation in the community that we lived in. That's why I went, not because I desired the things of God. Mm. So as, as time moves on and went to college, and uh, actually it was through my, my girlfriend, Summer. So she had moved down here to go to, to UMC Medical School. And so a friend from high school was living down here in Brandon and was going to Crossgates Baptist Church, which is where I now work, that something? which I'd never heard of. <laughs> and so she invited uh, my girlfriend Summer to come to church one night, and she went, and she's like, you need to come to this church. It was a really awesome experience, and I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like a good date to me. <laughs> well, why would I want to go to church when my mother's not expecting me to, or, you know, all these kinds of things. That box has been checked <laughs> Yeah, <long> exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I went, I still remember. Um, we had pews, and I think they were a light purple color. Uh, those have since long been gone. But we sat in the balcony because that's what you do, right? You sit as far back as you can. But I literally still remember, this was in 2002, sitting in the balcony, college student at Mississippi State, uh, but doing some uh, interning here in Jackson. And so we went over there to church one morning, and I was sitting in the balcony. I remember looking at the people during worship, and some of them had their eyes closed, and some of them had their hands raised. And I just remember thinking, these people act like God is like personal to them. Wow. And that was like a new thought for me. Mm. I had been to Sunday school and church and, and discipleship training and Wednesday night and VBS and I did Bible drill for however many years. I had done all the things that you do in a church. Mm. But for some reason I had missed this idea that God's a personal God mm -hmm. and wants a personal relationship. My idea of God and salvation was just some information that I had to agree to. Wow. and then try to keep up 
uh, my own salvation, so to speak, by, by just being a little bit more good, doing a little bit more good than bad in my life. But I remember thinking, something's different. And then the pastor preached, and I'm thinking, it's like God was opening my ears. Do you remember so, what his sermon was? I don't remember his sermon. I remember seeing him down there. And I just remember when I walked out, though, uh, they had a bookstore, uh, so to speak, a little place where you could buy sermon cassette tapes. Now I'm showing my age, okay? Yes. I still had these in the garage, but I bought uh, a sermon cassette tape series called Seeking His Kingdom First from Matthew chapter 6. six yeah. yeah. And so what I did is, I, is when I got back uh, into my apartment is I began to listen to these sermon tapes. And for the first time in my life, I picked up a Bible and began to read it for myself. So my mom always made sure I had a Bible with me when I went off to college and a mm -hmm. devotion book, but it just sat there, right? But I began to pick it up because I had this thought, maybe Jesus is more real than I ever knew. Okay. And so I was on a journey. I'm telling you, I went to Walmart. And I looked for a book that was spiritual, and I saw a book that said Jesus on it, and I bought it. Thankfully, it was Max Licato. Thanks, okay. Thankfully, so, it's a good one. Because you, know, you never know what you're going to get <laughs> right. you know, at Walmart. So, But I remember I even skipped class um, one day because I was so caught up reading the Bible. Wow. And my friend, I played guitar, and I was in a... We were in a rock band together and all that. Those oh, all things. I didn't know that about you. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, but the reason I tell that is one of our favorite bands was playing in Starkville. And he asked me, he said, man, we want to go, go see them tonight. And I lied to him and said, no, I have homework because I was the engineer. Yes. You know, I've got this homework to do. Really, I want to stay in my room and read the Bible. Wow. But I didn't want anybody to know because I didn't know anybody my age that read the Bible. That was so foreign to me that someone would talk about God my age and read the Bible when we weren't in a church setting. Wow. And so it was uh, in the spring of 2003, so just just been 20 years ago, I was sitting there reading my Bible, and I understood for the first time God didn't want me to be good. He wasn't looking for me to modify my behavior or go through some ritual of baptism. No, He was looking for me to surrender my life to Him, mm. that I was spiritually dead, and that He sent Jesus to take my place and die for all my sins. And so I surrendered my life to him there in my apartment. Like I believed for the first time wow. that, that I needed to be saved personally, that Jesus died for my sins. And it just completely wrecked me that day. And so I'm telling you, it's like my, my mind changed that day. I, I'm not joking. When I say I looked out the window after that, it's like the sky was bluer. Like my, my goals in life had changed. Like the way I saw the world was different. That's what and you so, mean by surrender. Yeah. Like... I had been what I know now. I had been saved, born again. I had been transformed by surrendering my life to Christ. But I couldn't put words to it then. All I knew is that God had done something in my life, but I really didn't know who to call or what to do. And it was a it was a process for you. Plus, it wasn't like a several month process. You you did a lot of study and reading. Yeah. And, and and one big thing was was Christian radio. Really. So I had I loved music, and then. I love my mom. She bought me, uh, she just went into, I guess she knew something was going on with me. She went into to a bookstore and asked for some CDs and they gave her a Jars of Clay and a Third Day CD. Oh, wow. Okay, when that came out. And so she gave me those CDs and I thought, you know, this isn't so bad, <laughs> you know. And then that old radio station, 93.5, that used to be at yes, EFC. I uh -huh, don't know if you remember that. I do. <laughs> well, I started listening to some of that and I'm like, well, that's not so bad. But there's words in that music. That's right. And those words were doing something, calling me to question all of this. And so God used several different things. It was a process. But then in the spring of 2003 is when, looking back, I can say, I know for sure that I surrendered my life fully to Christ and He yeah. changed my life. And so did you get the call immediately to be full-time ministry, or was that a process That's also? That's a great question. Uh, so God did this thing in me where I had... Uh, an incredible hunger for the Bible and for the Word of God, like from the moment that happened. Like I wanted to go to church and hear the Bible preached. Like I wanted to be around. I wanted to understand Him through this book. And so I was a five-year college student. <laughs> not, because, not because I had flunked anything or whatever, but because I interned for three semesters. And so I say that to say all my friends had already graduated. And so I roomed by myself the last year of college. And so literally, if I wasn't doing math problems for engineering, I was reading the Bible and trying to understand 
what does it mean to be right with God and what just happened to me and what's the point of life and so I'm trying to process all this and remember mm-hmm. I don't have any friends this way mm-hmm. you know so I'm just going through all this on Did my own. Did you have any kind of mentor or anybody okay. well, it, to reach out to? So by God's grace at Mississippi State, there was a man named Butch Simmons, uh, who at the time his wife was the uh, secretary in, for the football coach. And so he, on campus, was meeting with students and discipled them. I just saw him out one day handing out these little flyers, and I had taken one and put it in my room. And so when this happened in my life, and... I was saved and surrendered my life to Christ. I knew who to call. Well, I had one of these flyers. Wow. And so somehow I had his number. I'd been to like one of their gatherings in this process and I called him up and I went over to his house and he just began to take me under his wing. And he introduced me to another student on campus who he had been discipling. So for that last year, I began to meet people who Jesus was real to them. Wow. And so I began to grow in my faith. And so I had this call to the Bible and so uh, I got another friend uh, who had been a Christian longer than me. I said, hey, man, I feel like we need to do a Bible study for, for the engineers or whatever because I was in class with them. I knew what they were doing, what they talked about. Well, he sent an email out to every engineering major uh, for mechanical engineering. And so uh, we had a Bible study during lunchtime. And I'm thinking, oh, some of these you know people I've seen that are Christians are going to come. Guess who came to the Bible study? The ones that I would say were farthest from God wow. came to that lunchtime Bible study. And so that was my, really my first time of teaching the Bible. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I look back at it now. I think we spent five weeks in the very first chapter of John. Like I was going like little section by section. And I don't know if I lost him or what. Wow. But it was just this thing in me. I want people to know the Word of God changed my life. But then also I'm graduating as, a, as an engineer. I didn't want to go and be an engineer. I just didn't. But I didn't know what to do. And so my mm-hmm. wife Summer had come to faith at the same time as well. And so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. We're going to get married. We're getting married, but but I'm thinking maybe I'm being called to be a pastor. I didn't know anything else. Maybe I'm called to be a preacher. Well, it just wasn't it just wasn't God's time. And I got offered a job in Vicksburg, and so she was finishing up X-ray school here and was going to go to ultrasound school. And so I ended up taking an engineering job. But I always had in the back of my mind, well, one day God's going to send me a letter in the mail. He's going to handwriting on the wall. I'm going to be a missionary or I didn't think I was good enough to be a pastor. Like I had all these thoughts, like I, I just didn't know. So I, but long story short, very long story short, um, my dad got sick or diagnosed with ALS in 2007. Mm-hmm. And so going through that journey of caring for him mm-hmm. for a year and a half, we kept him at home, ventilator, feeding tube, all that. But seeing God did a great work in his heart and life too through that. and. It was an extremely difficult time, and in 2009, uh, God called him home. Mm. So I had switched engineering jobs uh, in January of that year, and then we moved from Clinton to Brandon in February, and then he went to heaven uh, in May, and then my wife Summer became pregnant with our daughter in August, and then I lost my job in December. Oh, wow. So 2009 was was a year for us. And so I was probably at one of the lowest points in my life spiritually, um, just from the standpoint of, I mean, we were caring for my dad for a year and a half. We were out of church because we would go take care of him for the Mm -hmm. weekend. And my wife was a trooper. I mean, we had a newborn baby, Jonah, that you Mm -hmm. delivered. And so um, just a few months after he was born, we would pack up everything and we would go to Carthage and help take care of him for the weekend. And so, you know, just work and caring for him and not being able to be around other believers Mm -hmm. and It was just a a difficult time in our life, but, you know, and then God called him home. And so trying to figure out what do I do? Now what? Now what? (laughs) And then all of a sudden I get um, uh, invited into an office (laughs) with a bunch of other guys. And they say, hey, guys, um, you're all, you no longer have a job anymore. Wow. So I did something, though, that I'd never done before. Uh, So I decided I was going to get up just like normal, and like I was going to work, but I was going to go be alone with God. And I asked God, why did you create me? Like, what did you put me on earth for? Mm -hmm. Because I could have went right back. I'd only been in that engineering job 11 months. I could have went right back. Had a very good reputation at the other job. I could have just went right back to the other one. Um, But I didn't want to do that because I was dissatisfied. Um, You know, they say you should never go into vocational ministry or try to be a pastor or whatever if you can do anything else because 
you want to make sure God's calling you that because it is challenging. There's a lot that goes into it, and you're never not at work. Mm-hmm. You know, always there's always things going on. Mm-hmm. So phone calls or a message to preach or, or whatever it is. But I didn't want to just go right back into engineering. So I, I just began to pray and say, God, what did you create me for? And so I went to one day. I went to some of the land we have out in in the country, and I remember th- reading about Moses. Moses met with God on the mountain. So I, I walked up to the highest part of in the woods of the land we had, and uh, I just asked God, "Why did you create me? What do you want me to do with my life?" And so I didn't hear anything out loud. So I've never heard God out loud, but I really felt in here, God was saying, "Men, the brokenhearted." I wanted Him to tell me He wanted me to be some preacher. <laughs> okay, that's what I wanted. But men, the brokenhearted. So I was like, "Okay." So you know, I'm journaling, I write this down, and so. What does that mean? You know, this is in December of '09, and so I decided, well, I'm not going to go right back into engineering. I'm going to, I'm going to see what does it mean to go to seminary. So I spent a semester going to a seminary, not the one I ended up graduating from. I just said I'm just going to try this, audit some classes, and see what happens. And as I'm doing that and and trying to figure out what does God want me to do with my life, and I remember one Sunday morning I walked into Cross Gates Baptist Church and. Uh, our pastor David Jett is a great man of God, and he walks by the Spirit. And so I remember this Sunday morning, uh, we're in the middle of worship, and he gets up and says, um, "God's saying He wants to move in people's lives right now." And so he didn't preach a sermon that day. He said, "We're about to open up and go into an invitation." So I mean, we've been in there, wow. you know, maybe two songs, three songs, whatever it is, and now we move into invitation, and God began to speak to me preach the gospel like it was almost like a record going in my mind and I went down front and had somebody pray for me and for the next several days every time I closed my eyes to pray I was just like I was hearing this preach the gospel preach the gospel so I took that as my sign that God was leading me into a a, a different phase of life that he was calling me uh, to serve his church to serve his people through mending the brokenhearted and preaching the gospel and so we're still trying to figure out what all that means (laughs) so but, but that's kind you're of, mending the brokenhearted, not only in your church, but also in prison ministry. That's oh, a big part of your exactly. service, right? So what I do now at, at Crossgates is, is community outreach pastor is I'm helping people live out their faith or live on mission with God, if you're familiar with that yeah. language. But basically, this idea that God has a purpose and plan for every person. And so what does that mean? And so lots of times serving people and helping people opens a door for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we do is we go into the prison, but not just pastors going into the prison. We have our members. And we we have some fantastic men and women that go into the prison every week that God is using in amazing ways. Not only just in general population, but one lady from our church. I mean, going into maximum security every week with the roughest ladies in the prison and sitting on the floor with them with an open open door, having Bible study with them. I mean, so part of my joy is helping make that happen. Wow. Or we do a lot. We've adopted a school, uh, Bates Elementary. We've been out there for, for five years. We just got our five-year award for tutoring uh, second graders out there. Wow. So we do a program called Arise to Read that started at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. But uh, basically we got to help, our church got to help bring that to the whole metro area. And so any church that wants to partner with the school uh, near them or adopt one like we did uh, in Jackson, uh, we can help you get started mentoring second graders because statistically if a child can't read by fourth grade, there's so many uh, hindrances and all these things going. So we go in and teach a child how to read, but it's bigger than that. If they can't read, how are they ever going to read the Bible? How are they going to read the Word of God? How can they be productive in life and reach their full potential? There's a direct correlation to prison too, right? Exactly. exactly. Incarceration. Exactly. And there's that's one reason they passed the uh, third grade reading test. The legislature did. So you have to be proficient at the end of third grade. So this program comes in at second grade to try to identify all that. And we just use ordinary people, ordinary believers who care about their community. And so our church, one of the blessings, we partnered with another church um, in Jackson. And so we get to come together and partner these students and invest in them so they can be all that God's created them to be. So a lot of those things, we work with uh, people in drug addiction, we have a huge benevolence ministry, food pantry, Uh, we have English as a second language. I mean, there's so many things, but basically my job is to help people go out and reach people who are brokenhearted. So one quick question before we uh, wrap up. Um, We 
made immediate connection. We're talking about real world things, drug addiction and prisons sure. and, um, you know, single family homes and, you know, single parent homes and uh, all the stressors in, in our real world. But we made a connection regarding discussion about supernatural and the supernatural worldview of the Bible. And you you gave a verse in Ephesians. Sure. Will you share that yeah. with us about yeah. that this is how you really equip people? <laughs> sure. And, and this is one of my favorite verses. But it's also uh, a pattern for what it is I'm doing day in and day out in the church and what I think every church ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so most people who've been around church a while, they know Ephesians 8 and 9, mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, mm -hmm. which is, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God so that no man can burst. But Ephesians 2.10 2, Ephesians 2, says, the very next verse says, we are God's workmanship, or his special creation, and we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. And so you think of this idea of what does it mean to have a worldview where I believe that I can actually be active in what God's trying to do across this world? Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, my worldview was limited to God just wanted me to read the Bible, be saved, and try to be a good person. But he was distant from me. Mm -hmm. What this verse tells us is before the foundation of the world, God has purposed and created unique and specific things for us to do. And that's why he placed us into time and geography for a reason. So and it's time and geography. Yes. Time, as in I was born in 1981. That's time. Geography is I, I was born in Mississippi or I now live in Mississippi. Right. So you may not always stay in the place you were born, but wherever you are, it's for a reason. Mm. So I, I uniquely and genuinely believe that God, I just believe that verse. And so a lot of times we grow up, we read things, but do we really believe them? Right. You know? And so if it literally, if you get out your Bible and what you see is, and this is what I always try to point out when I'm, when I'm helping people live on mission and doing the teaching is, we're not saved by our good works. Our faith in Jesus alone is what saves us. Mm -hmm. But he has saved us, that verse says, because we're his workmanship, literally his masterpiece or his Master special creation. Mm -hmm. So that means God created me with red hair, to be 6'4", whatever reason that is, okay? And had me born in 1981 in Mississippi in a small little town for a reason. I would have loved to have been a cowboy if it was up to me, okay, in the 1800s. But that's not what he wanted for me. But think about this. This is the part where I think we really enter, enter into this supernatural worldview is where we believe what it says. God says he's prepared things in advance for us to do mm. that we should walk in. That's the key to that verse. It's one thing to say, okay, well, yeah, God did that before the foundation of the world. But then he says it's up to us to walk in it. Mm. So I think about it like this real quick. When I was young, my dad um, had bought a piece of land, and we got in his pickup truck one day. And I said, what are we doing? You know, we got to this land, and uh, he said, we're going to make a road for this land. He said, there's a pond. So it was like, it was like uh, imagine a field and there's some trees, you know, with like tall grass and there's some trees intermersed between them. And so he said, there's a pond down there. And so what we did, we got in his truck and we drove a path from the road down to that pond. And then he turned around and he drove back the same way. And we did that probably 20 times in a row, the exact same path. Well, what was he doing? He was creating a road. So guess what that let me do? I got to get on my four-wheeler and get my fishing pole and come back on my own and get to the pond by following the road that he created. Wow. And so I think about that with that verse. God has already created the, the tracks or the road or whatever it is for us, uniquely us. If we're followers of Christ, he has something unique and specific for us to do. It's up for us just to walk down that road and see what's along the way and what's at the end of it. That's beautiful, walking that Walking that path sure. already created yeah. for you. Exactly. That's awesome. Exactly. And so part of what I'm doing is trying to live that out for myself. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm excited about the Go Tell Crusade because I believe that he, for whatever reason, all, all the things that I've been through in my life, the false conversion when I was young, mm -hmm. the study of historic Christianity in seminary and my dissertation, all that I was doing, reading about things, I was literally reading about historic moves of God in the 1800s and studying for a whole year and then how would I know a few months later God would allow me to be a part 
of something just like that mm -hmm. for our day. And so, but then I want to also mobilize the church to do that. So I'd encourage every believer, take out their Bible, read Ephesians 2.10 and pray and say, God, what is it you have created me for? And what did you prepare in advance for me to do? Because I want to walk in it. That's awesome. You know, you think about um, there may be someone in October who's waiting for you to lead them to Christ. I mean, how That's exciting exactly is right. that? That's exactly right. All you have to do, you can go to our website, which is uh, www.metromsgotel.com, metromsgotel.com, and you can click Get Involved. And if you want to be a counselor, we will train you, mm. and you can come and literally be at a place where people far from God are coming down and saying, help me find forgiveness of my sins. Wow. Help lead me in that. God's doing the work, but he lets us be a part of it. He lets us be a part of what he's already doing. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's beautiful. So what's your favorite scripture? So my favorite scripture is probably uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, where it says, Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The mm -hmm. old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And the reason that's my favorite scripture is because for a long time I was in church, but I wasn't in Christ. I was mm -hmm. in Sunday school, but I wasn't in Christ. And so when I truly came into that relationship with Christ in 2003, Everything in my life changed. Mm -hmm. And the last part of that verse says, the old things have passed away. And it's actually a command. The word behold is a command there. It says, take notice, the new things have come. So it reminds me along this Christian journey now that I'm in Christ, not to focus on the old ways or the old past or any of that, to keep my eyes on the new things that he did in me in salvation that he wants to continue to do in me. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Ryan I'm Wade. Glad to be here. What a great, great time with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this episode. Now you engage where God is at work. Please make sure to like and subscribe so you will be notified of future episodes.